Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very glad to, to see you again. I hope you had a very nice uh, lunch break and that you enjoyed this morning's uh, session. So we had very nice introduction speeches uh, in the very first part of the day to really look at how European instruments and international initiatives in general are driving international cooperation uh, and renewable development in Africa. Uh, we also had a first deep dive, which was very insightful with many colleagues on how this cooperation can also help unlock uh, the benefits, socioeconomic benefits, jobs, access to water, health and other critical resources in uh, this continent. And I am now very, very happy to be hosting the second deep dive session of our side event on solar business opportunities in emerging markets. I am Aurélie Beauvais, the Deputy CEO of Solar Power Europe, and very, very glad to be your host for the day and for this last session about green hydrogen in Africa. Now, green hydrogen, it is really something that is very trendy at the moment. We have seen that it is definitely the case in Europe, uh, where we see a lot of initiatives happening. What we know is that this uh, technology may not there, uh, be there yet, but the potential and the opportunities are very significant. And what is very interesting is also to see that, as usual, in emerging markets, we really see a leapfrogging phenomenon, jum jumping directly to the latest technologies. And that's also why we thought it was very interesting already today to explore how the, the hydrogen market and the renewable hydrogen market in particular is kind of cooking in Africa. What is the state of play? What are the opportunities? Um, what are the challenges? Pro probably as well and also exchanging with our very nice panelists about the timing and the sequence because i think when we have the whole discussion about uh, renewable hydrogen and when we talk about areas with half of the population that doesn't even have access to electricity the how you do it with whom you do it and what are the criteria that you need to take into account for developing those green hydrogen projects is absolutely critical so to explore all those dimensions, I am absolutely delighted to have a very nice panel with me today, Mr. Uh, Solomon Wabweze Agbo, which is senior scientist and project manager at I uh, apology, I cannot pronounce that. I'm too French, but I will say Fochungrenstrum <laughs> Juli. And apologies for that, you will present that much better than me. We have uh, Charlotte Ussi, I see Charlotte smiling too, but GIZ is much easier to say, advisor for power fuels at GIZ, so the German uh, Development Cooperation. Dr. Chipo Shoniwa, which is a national team leader uh, for the project uh, Green H2 Atlas, who will uh, talk to us a bit about Southern Africa and Fortunate Farirai, which is national team leader for the H2 Atlas project, and she will um, talk to us about Zimbabwe. So thank you so much to everyone uh, for being here. I'm absolutely delighted to host this conversation, which I think is going to be uh, very interesting. And without further ado, I'm very happy to hand over to Solomon, uh, which is really driving the H2 Atlas project um, uh, from Europe uh, as well, and ensuring the coordination of all uh, these projects across Africa itself. Solomon, can you tell us about this H2 Atlas uh, project and what does it tell us about green hydrogen in Africa? So thank you very much uh, for that introduction and I'm really very glad to be here and to be able to share the work we are doing with the H2 Atlas project with um, the rest of the people who are in the platform. So thank you again for, for the invitation. So the project is H2 Atlas Africa. So we are, I will just uh, present quickly an overview of uh, what we are doing in the project and then some of the insights we already received with regards to the work that uh, we have done already. So the project actually uh, started, you know, alongside uh, when the, the German government launched the national hydrogen strategy. And within the national hydrogen strategy, it was very clear that uh, if hydrogen has to play a very, that hydrogen has a very key role to play in terms of uh, decarbonizing the, the the energy sector, in terms of uh, bringing in new value to the energy mix. And so it is very clear that uh, green hydrogen will be the way to go. And like 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 we all know, uh, 
global warming is a national issue and if this is the case then it will require um, a cross-border initiative to drive so it's in this understanding that uh, the bmbf so the german federal ministry of education and research decided to explore a partnership with africa and then to be able to look at also the possibilities or the potentials that exist for green hydrogen generation in Africa as a partner in, in this global effort uh, to, to drive uh, economy via green hydrogen. So what's the project all about? So the H2 Atlas project, the next slide please. So the H2 Atlas project basically is uh, aimed at uh, profiling or finding out the potentials of green hydrogen generation in Africa. So looking at the technological, but also looking at the environmental and social economic feasibility assessment uh, for Africa as a whole. So as a starting point, we, we started with West and, Southern, West and Southern Africa. So we started in January of uh, last year, and we would be doing this also till, till the end and the early bit of beginning of next year. So the main partners are the Research Center, Yuli, so Fashion Center in Yuli. So we have the technical lead, and then we have partners also in Africa, so we have uh, WASCA, the West African Science Service Center for Climate Change and Land Use in Accra, that's helping us to coordinate the whole of the, the ECOWAS region. And then we have the, the counterpart in, uh, that's called SASCAL in Windhoek in Namibia, that's also helping us to coordinate the rest of the Southern African region. And we also have some other associate partners like, the, the, like, like SACRI, so SACRI is the the energy efficiency, renewable energy and energy efficiency arm of SADAC. And then the, the partner ICRI, that's equivalent of, uh, of the same energy and uh, renewable energy and energy efficiency of ECOWAS. So they are also partners and they are, these are quite strategic partners. I'll talk about that uh, a bit later. So like I said before, so the main, ba the main aim is to create a, a database to show what potentials exist in these regions for the production of uh, green, uh, hydrogen and how much this, of course, in one way will profit the local people and then, of course, in, in, in another way to contribute to the global uh, effort to drive, uh, to bring uh, hydrogen into the mainstream of the energy mix as also a way of so addressing the issue of global climate change. Okay, so the, 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 the question is, the next slide, please. So the question is, why Africa? So why is Africa in, in focus? There are a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, please, the next slide, you would see, you, you see that um, in Africa we have huge renewable energy potential. So whether you look up in the north or, or down in the south or even across the, 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 the west through the east, you see huge renewable energy potentials in terms of wind, in terms of solar. And then another very, very big issue, very big uh, resource available in Africa is uh, uh, land. So we have vast land resources actually puts the whole of the US, the whole of Europe together in terms of land mass, land area, for example, you, the, the whole of Africa is much, uh, much bigger. So that's, that's huge. That's a huge resource. I'll talk about this again and how this translates to green hydrogen production. But then another thing you find about resources in Africa is we have huge uh, um, human capacity. So if you look at this, uh, this graph, you will see that the median age in Africa, it's, it's less than 20. So this is huge in terms of capacity. And then you would also see that in terms of water, you also have a lot of resources. So there are, there are, there are several uh, rivers with catchment areas that's over 100,000 kilometers. You have several uh, lakes running into several kilometers uh, and then we have uh, Africa has one third of the world's uh, major international water basins. So these are also huge resources, and these are resources that will that are very relevant for the production of green hydrogen. So, we, but in terms of human capacity, in terms of water, in terms of renewable energy resources, in terms of even land availability, because you would need land to be able to place your infrastructure, whether it is the renewable energy uh, resources that you would want to harness or even the infrastructure in general you need for your green hydrogen technology, you would need land and then you have this um, quite a lot in Africa. So the other thing that also makes, makes Africa attractive is the fact that you have, uh, apart from these resources, you also have opportunities. Uh, the next slide, please. You have, um, 
huge opportunities, then you also have a lot of prospects. So the development in Africa in terms of GDP has also been very uh, impactful in terms of its contribution to the global GDP in the last uh, few years. And I think that uh, because of the, the, the growing uh, uh, need, I think this, would, this trend will continue also in the years to come, that Africa continues to, to bring a lot in the table in terms of its contribution to, to global GDP. So in terms of prospect, in terms of opportunity, in terms of markets, there are lots of opportunities and possibilities in Africa as a whole. So these are basically why it's relevant that Africa contributes in, in, this, uh, in, in terms of uh, being a big market for not just green hydrogen generation, but also utilization. The next slide, please. So the question is, so within our project, we, like I said before, we, are, we, we started to, with West Africa and Southern Africa as a starting point. And in West Africa, we are actually covering the whole of the ECOWAS countries. So the 15 countries in ECOWAS, and then in Southern Africa, we are actually technically looking at also all the countries in, in, in SADAC. Uh, next slide, please. So within our research center, we have a, a number of uh, institutes that are involved in this project because it is highly interdisciplinary. So we have institutes that are looking at just as, as doing an assessment on renewable energy potentials. So we have institutes that are also looking at the, the, the photovoltaics, for example, uh, looking at the relevant models that you you would need to be able to to quantify or to be able to 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 estimate renewable energy potentials that you have, we have also groups that are looking at also the socio-economic and political context that are relevant for green hydrogen generation. Then we also have institutes within our research center that are specifically looking at uh, water availability at this at this point, just looking at groundwater doing the groundwater mapping, finding uh, where you have suitable and rechargeable groundwater that can drive uh, green hydrogen production in, in the whole of Africa, Western Southern Africa. Okay, so this is our approach, and this is very important for us in the project. Our, in, one thing as, that for us is very underlying in the project is that every stakeholder, it's important. Whether for us here in Germany or our partners in Africa, our stakeholders, we take very seriously, and our approach is that it's important at the end that you have a win-win situation in the partnership. So we, we have um, the project structured in a way that it reflects this approach. So in each country, we have a coordination team, and this coordination team is made up of uh, people taking, experts taking from the different ministries and government agencies that are relevant or that have that has something to do with the, with the subject. And we also, these national, uh, national uh, teams, then they help us together with the project to discuss, to somehow generate national dialogue, to make sure that you get, you get input from the, from the local people. You bring in also the local perspective, the local preferences in the discussion in terms of um, what we do in the project and then what has to be done afterwards. So this is very important for, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, where the topic is still uh, beginning to, to pick up. The next slide, please. So this is um, within the, technically, so within the project, this is a basic overview of our guiding criteria. So first we are looking at, like I said before, basic assessment criteria for, for what we are doing. So we look at land eligibility. So this is very important that we look at the the total land area, but then take out or do uh, an assessment to make sure you take out land that is available for other land uses. So you have land use for, for agriculture, you have land use for residential buildings, you have land use for reserved, you have land reserved for, 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 for parks and all that. So in partnership with our, our, our partners, our different countries, we find out for what is, what these um, reserved areas are for each country, and then we take out all of these so that we are able to find the land that's actually eligible for green hydrogen production. This is very important because it is in the land that you're going to build up your PV parks or build up your, your wind parks. And you, we also do not want to have a situation where you have a, a conflict of use in terms of uh, you know, having to use land that is 
are you marked by the people for some other purposes? So then within the assessment, we also look at renewable energy potential. So where we look at uh, how much you have in terms of PV, how much power you can generate technically, how much you can also generate from wind, not just wind onshore and offshore. So we do all of that. So that's where we are at the moment, PV, wind, onshore and offshore. Our, in our next step, we're also going to be looking at hydro potential. Then we look at the hydrogen infrastructure placement. So like I said, where and how, then try to make a design of an energy system that's able to, to, to put all of this together. Then we look at the local demands, so the local preferences. This is very important to look at the, the energy situation within the, the different uh, locations or the different countries where the supply would be necessary for the local use, first of all, or where a part of this can be used also to drive uh, uh, local activities. So these are all aspects that we take into consideration in the project. The next slide, please. So I have just a summary of the, the guidelines that we, we take into consideration and that we have taken into consideration in the work that we are doing. So we look at the, the geography, the environment, the resources, like I said, just to ensure that we do not have any conflict of use, whether it is water, whether it is land. Then we are also looking at the future climate development. This is very important because if you have resources like water, you have resources like land, we are making a projection into 50, 100 years from now. How does the climate change affect resources that are available, whether it is water or land and all of that? So this is very important. And we are looking at also, of course, the renewable energy potentials like I talked about. We're looking at infrastructure and logistics. So where do you have the deep sea, whether you have already, existing pipelines, networks, looking at the grid infrastructure and possibility to either do a grid system or a standalone system. Then we are also uh, factoring in the, the different uh, political situation in the different countries, the ease of doing business, the, the, um, uh, the, the climate, uh, the, the, the situation that supports the production of um, green hydrogen in the in the in the different countries then we are looking at also of course the labor markets and looking at the local needs how much capacity exists for hydrogen utilization and then what the other possibilities are that that can be explored for the different countries so these are basically our guiding principles okay so this is how our work is structured so we have the input in terms of data so we have a huge data set. Some of this uh, we collected from open open source data. Some of this also we collected in, in partnership together with our partners for the different countries. Then we have several models that we have broken down. So we have this the model broken down in different work packages, looking at different things like I, like I already talked about. So land eligibility, social political context, future climate, renewable energy potential assessment and all of that, what availability, then the local demands. So at the, at the, in the end, we have these results put together in an atlas. So an interactive atlas that shows the hydrogen potentials in terms of numbers. So we are able to quantify technically the amount of hydrogen that you can generate in each of the locations. Then we are also able to quantify in terms of cost, the unit price of a kilo of hydrogen in each of the, the, the locations in, the, in, the, in all the countries that are involved in this project. The next slide, please. Okay, so like I said, so in the end, this would be what we deliver, an atlas that is interactive, that's in it, that, that will, of course, be available for the public. And then in the end, we will quantify, so in terms of cost, in terms of numbers, how much quantity can be generated and at what cost. This would be important for, 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 for all stakeholders. And then we are also, we are going to come up um, with concepts for pilot project. I'll talk about this uh, in some of our findings at the end. Okay, the next slide. So just to, to give an indication of um, our, our initial results, um, this will still be made public at the moment, um, there would be there would be a press release. This was supposed to happen a few days ago, but for some reason, uh, this was shifted. So this would happen uh, by the 20th of May. There's going to be a formal press release of these results by the the BMBF, so the German mm -hmm. Ministry that is funding the research. But at the moment, I, I could just say one from our results. So the renewable energy potentials in Africa is huge, 
really. So whether it's PV, whether it's onshore and offshore wind, huge, huge, huge in terms of number and huge in terms of the cost. Cost, as in, so cost, I mean, is comparable to what you could get anywhere else in any part of the world. The cost is quite competitive, very competitive, highly attractive, and then the, the numbers are huge. Then the second thing I would like to mention, like I said, so at this moment in our project, we have limited our investigation to groundwater. We are going to, to expand, of course, but our initial, uh, one of the, the initial indicators that is, that uh, we, we see clearly is that um, you cannot really depend on, on just groundwater. So there is a big limitation to the, to the maximum technical potential of green hydrogen generation that you can get if you just rely on groundwater. So this is a huge limiting factor. And so the, the way to go really would be to, to explore um, using desalinated water, which you know, has been shown that this doesn't uh, cost too much in terms of uh, numbers, in terms of uh, cost. Mm -hmm. And then another thing I would like to say uh, strongly is that uh, there is a huge potential to also do a, a cross-border resource exchange in terms of building up a green hydrogen infrastructure for, for the region. So whether it is West, West Africa or Southern Africa. So because sometimes you see that uh, the locations where you have the best of renewable energy may not be exactly where you have the best of uh, water resources. So there could be a possibility that countries could get into some form of agreement to either exchange water, transport water, or transport electricity, depending on the infrastructure that's available. So in the end, this would be very relevant you know, to, mm -hmm. to maximize uh, existing resources and, of course, strengthen uh, cross-border cooperation. So these are basically um, the initial results. And then finally, I would like to end with some other, uh, sorry, the next slide just to 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 conclude with some other parts of the h2 atlas project so one is a graduate school so the bmbf is funding a a, a master's program that's uh, established in four different african countries that will really have a focus on renewable energy and green hydrogen so this master's program will start in october so we are currently recruiting students so in total, there will be 60 students across West Africa. And this program is being supported from our research center together with uh, our partner university, RWTH Arken, and also being funded by the BMBF. So this is just to support the local capacity building if, you know, to, to, to really uh, accelerate the uptake of the technology in Africa. So this is very important if if the technology has to really be sustainable when it kicks off in Africa, that we build some local uh, uh, know-how. And we will do this also, some form of training for our partners, also in terms of uh, technical know-how in the technology. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's it from my side, and that's uh, a quick overview of um, what we're doing in the project. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Solomon. I mean, first, uh, I mean, congratulations, because I think this uh, this project, I mean, the H2 Atlas, even, even myself, I'm quite looking forward to the results because I think it's, uh, you know, uh, in the EU, we talk a lot about that, uh, about potentially making Africa an export hub, etc. We're going to talk about it afterwards, but I think such projects are actually necessary first step to, to really look at the resources. Uh, and, and I think many, many companies and stakeholders are going to await uh, for these results very very fiercely also heard your call for students uh, students so i'm sure we have plenty of students in the audience that's your chance uh, 60 spots i heard so do not hesitate to contact solomon after the conversation uh, if you're interested actually to take part in this exciting project um, so from the general overview and thanks a lot we will we will go again into the details of this project we are going to go one level down from africa to south africa so already closing a bit more the scope and the focus uh, dr chipo shoniwa so you're one of the team leaders one of those uh, uh, local uh, sustainability soldiers kind of uh, which are contributing to making this success um, th this project uh, successful gathering local data what can you tell us about uh, the hydrogen potential then in South Africa, according to uh, the data that you have been able to collect uh, at this point in time. Thank you very much. Can you share? 
Yes, I can Am hear I you. Am I presenting my slides now? Can you share my slides? Or... Yes, we will share it in a, in a minute. Can someone uh, put Chipo's slide? Because I still sh see Charlotte. It will take a it will take a second, I guess. Okay, it's there. Super. Go ahead, Chipo. Okay, I'm um, Chipo Shonyua from Zimbabwe. Actually, a point of correction: I am a team member for Zimbabwe Hydrogen Atlas Group but I'm going to present on South Africa. Next slide, please. I will start with the, the renewable energy potential in South Africa. It's already been alluded by Solomon. For us to come up with green hydrogen, we need renewable energy resources. So for South Africa, there is great potential for the production of uh, renewable energies. Uh, I'll look at the uh, solar energy. The country has a vast amount of solar energy. In fact, it has about 2,500 sunshine hours per year. With that amount of uh, solar energy, we are <coughs> sure that if we want to do electrolysis of water from solar, we will be able to do that because we are able to get enough electricity from this renewable energy resource was it abundant in the country. Also, another major important renewable energy resource for the production of green hydrogen is wind. In South Africa, Wind is usually measured at a height of 10 meters. At that 10 meters height, which is very close to the ground, the average wind speeds are between 5.6 and 8.7 meters per second. And as we know, the higher we go, the wind speeds would increase. If wind turbines are to be installed, they will not be at a height of 10 meters. They will be up maybe above 100 meters, above 50 meters. At that speed, at that height, the wind speeds are greater. We are sure of getting high amounts of electricity, which will be able to power our electrolyzers and come up with green hydrogen. We also have great hydrogen put hydro potential in the country from dams and rivers which flow perennially. We have an about 4.8 gigawatts potential for hydroelectricity. So with these amounts of renewable energy resources, the country is so sure that what we only need are the resources to set up the infrastructure for production of green hydrogen because the raw materials for that are there. Next slide. We have the advantages or pros, the reasons why we think hydrogen potential is there in South Africa. Already, the government of South Africa is the <clears throat> developing perfectly. It has started developing a hydrogen roadmap. So it's a roadmap which shows how the country will go about in the, taking up this green hydrogen so that it converts the country to a green hydrogen economy. This support from the government is a positive for green hydrogen. So the government is held for that. The major research center in the country, CSIR, is advocating for producing hydrogen 
has been dedicated to renewable energy hydrogen infrastructure. Because at the moment, the IPPs who are developing electricity from renewable energies are selling that electricity to ESCOM, the national utility for the country. And with that, there is nothing which is left for green hydrogen. If we have the dedicated renewable infrastructure, we are assured that we will have the full load hours to meet the green hydrogen electrolyzers requirements for electricity. So if this application continues and it is taken up, it's a plus for green hydrogen. We also have South Africa, which is a, a, an importer of fuels. So it doesn't have local capacity, it doesn't have local um, sources of fossil fuels. It imports from other countries. And we have already said it has the resources for production of green hydrogen. If the country is able to produce green hydrogen, then it will increase its energy security. It will increase the availability of local energy. So that's a plus for the country to have local production of, of energy. So this gives great potential for the uptake of green hydrogen in the country. The country has a vast amount of platinum, which is a major resource in the production of hydrogen fuel cells, which are used for the storage of this hydrogen. So that local availability will make sure that the country will valorize its minerals and will be able to export even that green hydrogen will be able even to export those fuel cells. In so doing, the country will generate foreign currency, which is much needed in the country for its development. There is already significant vehicle manufacturing facilities in the country. We have the companies like BMW, Mercedes-Benz, and Toyota already manufacturing vehicles in the country. If there is uptake of green hydrogen, these companies will in the end also start producing fuel powered, hydrogen fuel powered vehicles in the country. And the market is there. People are infusing fossil fuels which are contributing to abatement, to which are contributing to anthropogenic climate change. So the introduction of hydrogen-powered vehicles would be welcome in the country, since the fuel will be produced locally. It will, in the end, when there is mass production, cause the mobility to be a little bit cheaper as it is now, it will also make the country make its contribution to the abatement of climate change. We also have the, the of recent Toyota, which is one of the vehicle producing countries in the country, has signed a contract with the Sassel where they are wanting to develop green hydrogen mobility ecosystem in the country. That's a plus in the country. It shows that already different stakeholders are coming together to take up this green hydrogen. Once it is produced, valorization would okay and it will be of great importance in the country. So with these advantages, with these developments already taking place in the country, we are assured that South Africa is going very soon to be moving towards a green hydrogen economy. And us in Zimbabwe, being the neighbor of South Africa, 
we are sure we will be following the suit because most of our things we get from South Africa. But for this green hydrogen, we want to keep pace with them such that we, want, we don't want to go to import from them. We would also want to be exporting to them. Next slide, please. You will have one minute, Chipo, soon. We have the challenges. Independent power producers are finding it difficult because they said they are selling their power to ESCOM. We need them to be independent. We have some recurring droughts in the country in the past decades. This is limited the amount of water, but Solomon has suggested maybe the use of underground water and all South Africa being surrounded by the seas, the ocean, then water can be taken from the sea, although maybe the cost might be a bit high due to desalination processes. Then we have these water shortages might make other maybe stakeholders want water to be limited to other uses rather than for electrolysis. Next slide, please. So some steps have already been suggested so that the country moves towards green hydrogen. They need to finalize the hydrogen strategy in the roadmap. They need to clear ministerial direction around which government ministry would house this green hydrogen. There is the Ministry of Energy. There is also the Ministry of Trade and Industry. So that needs to be cleared. There is need to assess regulation enabling and competitive markets in the country. If some regulations are developed, then it's easier to follow those regulations in the process. There should be need for fast tracking of licensing of renewable energy production, which would lead to hydrogen production. There is need for signing up of collaboration agreements between hydrogen producers, off-takers, and various technology players. Next slide, please. You will need to finish, Chipo. So these are the references which I used. As I said, I'm not South African. I had to read to get this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chipo. I think that was uh, that that's really insightful and complementary, actually, to to what uh, Solomon presented. Uh, I really look forward to discussing further with you as well. Potentially, the the use cases. It's interesting to have the focus on the car manufacturing and see the the synergies there, uh, potentially, and we can discuss that at a at a later stage. So thank you so much. Maybe to finish with the H2 Atlas overview before we go into uh, the perspective of a development cooperation agency. Charlotte, if that is okay with you, I will give uh, the floor next to Fortunate Parirai, which uh, if you could, Fortunate, in, in five to seven minutes, uh, give us the the overview of the H2 Atlas from Zimbabwe. So I think we've gone to the whole continent from a more regional approach to uh, one country focus. I know that also on your side, obviously, the data is still on the process of being gathered. But what can you tell us uh, on this particular country about green hydrogen? Can you hear us, Fortunate? Maybe you need to unmute yourself. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that introduction. Uh, maybe what I can simply say, maybe initially when we spoke about this, um, we might not even be in a position to share on uh, H2 Atlas uh, project, but I will just share mainly on um, what Zimbabwe has been doing before on the when, when it comes to hydrogen. Uh, special mention goes to uh, uh like our coordinator for the project uh, dr jane Olds, and also uh dr solomon here present uh coordinating the project from Munich. and also special mention goes on to um charlotte hasi who actually um referred us uh forwarded our names uh from women in green hydrogen uh thank you so much for that um let me go into uh, my presentation. Next slide. 
Okay, uh, I will talk more on the energy situation in Zimbabwe. You would find that the national electrification uh, currently is at 42%, uh, where we have the installed capacity at 2,300 megawatts, and the current generation capacity is actually at 1,050 megawatts, and the peak demand is at 2,200 megawatts. And we are looking at the deficit of 1,250 megawatts. And you would find that uh, green hydrogen is a potential also to cover on the deficit, uh, which is um, uh, experienced in the country. And this currently we are having uh, also the issue of um, not shading because of winter. Uh, so you would find that uh, the green hydrogen coming into play will actually uh, serve an important uh, role in naturally uh, making sure that uh, there is access uh, to clean and affordable energy. Next slide. Okay, so the, the green hydrogen potential at national level, you find that Zimbabwe, there's a lot of potential to green hydrogen due to the abundance of renewable energy resources. And you'll find that uh, in Zimbabwe, we experience about 3,000 sunshine hours uh, per year, and a number of solar projects uh, and wind projects has been uh, done in the country through in, in independent power producers. And also, uh, I'm going to draw more on a case study of a company that has been generating um, uh, hydrogen, not specifically green hydrogen, but hydrogen uh, for fertilizer manufacture, which is uh, several chemicals. Next slide. Okay, so why I just I'm going to cover on the why uh, the interest is mainly on green hydrogen these days. Uh, you would find that there are cost reduction projections uh, that are uh, currently uh, there. You would find that uh, at the current uh, stage a kilogram of um, green hydrogen is costing between $2.50 to $6.80. And uh, by 2030, it is projected to uh, drop to $1.40 a, a kilogram. And also by 2050, it can uh, go down to $0.80 cents, um, uh, per kilogram. So there is need uh, to reduce carbon emissions to combat climate change and the cost competitive and, and cost is projected to drop, like what I mentioned. And also you would find that because of the renewable energy resources that are abundant in Zimbabwe, there is also potential uh, to export this green hydrogen um, to other neighboring countries, though those countries will, which might be experiencing uh, less uh, renewable energy resources. Next slide. So this is uh, actually a, a company, uh, which is a, a local company here in Zimbabwe, uh, Sebo Chemicals, uh, which is actually mainly uh, in, in the manufacture of um, uh, fertilizer. So you'd find that Zimbabwe's uh, economy is anchored more on agriculture. So this company's uh, functionality is actually beneficial uh, to to the to the country, uh, considering that uh, the fertilizer uh, that will be manufactured uh, from uh, hydrogen, uh, which is actually the the ammonia production, you would find that uh, it's actually of uh, of importance to the economy, as we know that uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, agricultural produce in our country and uh, we are also focusing more on uh, exporting a lot of uh, agricultural uh, uh, products to other uh, to other countries uh, next slide so this is the, the location uh, the specific location of where several chemicals is uh, located uh, here in, um, in zimbabwe and you would find that uh, this company was established in 1969, and due to the low uh, cost and abundance of uh, energy in that time, it led to establish um, an electrolysis plant in 1972, and uh, the hydrogen was produced, and it was mainly as a, as a chemical that was used for the manufacture of uh, 
ammonia. So you would find that uh, this technology of green of hydrogen production in Zimbabwe is not new. The only uh, new thing will be that uh, the hydrogen will be now um, the energy resource that will be needed to split water would be coming from the uh, from a renewable energy source. Next slide. Okay, uh, so this is actually mentioning, um, just summarizing the, the quantity of uh, ammonia that would be produced about 115,000 tons of um, ammonia uh, that would be produced, which is about 63% uh, that will be that is needed for, 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 for the manufacture of fertilizer. And we would find that the system used to use about 105 megawatts of electricity for the electrolysis uh, of water. But uh, moving forward, uh, next slide. Moving forward, the, the plant was decommissioned. Uh, the, the, the plant was decommissioned because uh, of the, the high energy requirements. It was decommissioned in 2015. And uh, actually, now uh, the company is now importing the ammonia uh, for the manufacture of fertilizer, and it's now using just uh, 10 megawatts of electricity. So there is no potential to actually ramp in uh, the, the the renewable energy resources so that uh, they can actually, especially solar, it can be used for the electrolysis of water, and actually uh, we can actually locally. Uh, produce uh, the, hydro the hydrogen instead of importing uh, the ammonia. Mm -hmm. Next slide. One minute, Fortunate. Perfect. Okay. So, in conclusion, I can say that uh, in Zimbabwe, there is so much potential uh, to produce um, this green hydrogen, considering what I have mentioned earlier, the renewable energy resources, about 3,000 sunshine hours per year, and actually, um, you would find that uh, there, there is actually a ready market, uh, especially for the fertilizer um, uh, manufacture. There is a ready market for it, considering that our economy is mainly uh, anchored on agriculture. So with that, I can say uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. And uh, I'm very much grateful that I've been given this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fortunate, and uh, thank you for, for this presentation. Uh, it, it's great to see that actually, indeed, uh, the, the hydrogen economy is starting to, to move and, uh, and also that there are some pre-existing infrastructure. That was a, a good example that you, you provided also with installation, which is actually quite old. So, so uh, I, I think we'll have an interesting conversation afterwards as to the stepping stones from now to then uh, enabling potentially a, a renewable hydrogen economy in Africa. So for the last presentation, before we enter uh, the debate, really happy to, to hand over the floor to you, Charlotte. GIZ, GIZ has been already extremely involved across a variety uh, of projects, obviously supporting the deployment of uh, renewables in Africa. Can you tell us what you're doing uh, on hydrogen and what is your perspective, your approach to developing such projects today? And you are mute. Sorry. <laughs> yes, thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction and also very exciting, of course, to hear from yeah, the country stories and also from the H2 Atlas and all the experience. Very excited to, to learn more from the publications uh, later this year. Um, yeah, if we want to start with the presentation, um, I really want to add here, I mean, I'm based in Germany, but uh, GIZ has offices all over the world, so I really want to share my perspectives now from yeah, the perspectives of a development uh, cooperation agency. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, and maybe a short introduction who we are. So for the people who don't know GIZ, we are 100% yeah, government owned, a non-profit company, and we support the German government in reaching sustainability goals and implementation of national agreements like 
the SDGs and also the Paris Agreement. And we work project-based, meaning that we mainly work for the German Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development, but also for the Ministry of Environment and other EU and governmental actors and partners. And as I said, we work worldwide, especially in developing and emerging countries, more than 120 countries worldwide and more than 1,600 projects. So it's really a big range between access to power, but also other sustainability um, yeah, um, goals that we are looking forward to, um, yeah, access to food, water, etc. So on the next slide, I will uh, yeah, talk about our activities we do in green hydrogen currently. So again, the map where we see the potentials of sun and wind uh, leading to different costs, of course, across uh, uh, South Africa, Southern Africa. Um, but um, yeah, maybe I don't want to do again, like a top down view, but more a bottom up view so that we can see, okay, what projects have already been installed in Sub-Saharan Africa. And we see two countries, again, South Africa, Zimbabwe, we already had a deep dive, so we can win maybe some minutes now uh, that we can use well in the discussion. And um, I wanted to include also Morocco and the Northern African region because, of course, we all have a lot of activities there as well uh, due to the proximity also to Europe and uh, to, to Germany. But today the focus is really on uh, the other four projects that we can see here. The first project, next slide. Um, yeah, it's um, an example from South Africa. We already le learned from Chipo very interesting facts. Um, something that I want to add maybe, or that I think is very exciting in, in South Africa is that Sasol is currently already operating a fissure drop reactor and fissure drops for um, the people who are not chemical experts here is the reactor that is needed to uh, yeah, create synthetic fuels basically. And currently this is ba uh, based, the fuel is based on um, coal liquid because of course Africa has a lot of coal resources and with this there's a high potential of um, reducing CO2 emissions of SASO which is actually the second largest CO2 emitter of the, of the country uh, when we replace this coal liquefaction with hydrogen. So this is possible and of course a big potential and therefore as we learned already from Tripo there's a big um, also interest, uh, political interest. We have the high platinum resources we already talked about and uh, this is also why of course GIZ uh, is quite interested uh, in the exchange there. They're also the um, um, the bilateral government discussion between Germany and South Africa led to an agreement that we want to work very closely together, Germany and South Africa. And also uh, South Africa and Germany have a very long basis of cooperation through the South African German energy partnerships. So we already um, yeah, helped in, uh, or supported in uh, setting up the hydrogen uh, roadmap. And we work on certification norms and standards. And also for the future, we look into capacity development and setting up networks through, for example, also South-South exchanges, study tours, business platforms, and uh, very closely with, of course, financial cooperation. We look into innovation calls to support research organizations and also go into the project preparation through scoping studies, in-depth project studies, and technical assistance. So we're really happy to support and work together very closely with the partners in South Africa. The next example is, yeah, on the next slide, a bit different and uh, here in Nigeria and Angola we see that from the map it doesn't look like the highest potential but what makes uh, the countries very interesting is that they have huge exports in crude petroleum so the whole economy is actually based on uh, those uh, petroleum exports almost 90 percent and so we as GIZ are currently working on energy policy dialogues also to sensibilize the decision makers in the countries to say okay there are ways on how to transform the energy and fuel economies using green hydrogen and power to x next slide zimbabwe we also learned about a lot about it so maybe i can skip the slide just maybe adding uh, we are also talking about this use case of the existing infrastructure also um, of sabler chemicals so we also are in or my colleagues uh, of course uh, who work very closely together with sabler and also with the government in zimbabwe on uh, looking on how to use actually this potential and they helped also applying for a technical feasibility study at uh, the african development um, to yeah, get some insights on technical and economic feasibility of this project and also there are discussions about other possible technical and financial cooperation measures 
together with Zimbabwe. Next slide. The last slide is about Kenya, and Kenya is maybe the most straightforward case because uh, Kenya has a surplus of renewable electricity in many um, yeah, days of a year. Over 90% of the electricity comes from renewable uh, sources, hydro, geothermal and solar, and the uh, production is also quite competitive. So they are not yet at two cents per kilowatt hour, but uh, there is the potential to go there. And uh, they also look really, or the motivation is also to decrease the, decrease the import dependency of oil derived fuels. And um, they see themselves as, as very well positioned as a hydrogen hub for Eastern Africa because they have significant harbor capacities for export, uh, export and also industrial clusters. And they have a relatively well developed financial sector, which is, of course, also very important the access to finance. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, we at GIZ also have a very strong collaboration with Kenya um, because, yeah, the, the the partners or the colleagues in the country are very active also discussing discussing with the government me and my team we also conducted the training for GIZ partners uh, for the ministry of energy the development banks and also diplomats to understand a bit also the narrative and um, yeah they the colleagues have uh, supported and setting up a baseline study or TORs for baseline studies and workshops uh, to really identify the potential for power to x and uh, look into the costs benefits risks and are also possible pathways for Kenya and uh, green hydrogen working group has been set up uh, and this is chaired by the ministry of energy so we see high level involvement uh, in Kenya so maybe to sum up on the last slide, um, we have we see a lot of potential also in sub-Saharan Africa, and we have maybe every week I get a call from a from a country in South Africa with a new case. And but it all it is also very interesting and very important, of course, to identify what are real potentials and what is possible. And I think there are some very very important preconditions, and we learned a lot about them a lot already. And maybe the most important is, of course, that we need significant shares of local renewable energies already, and also there should be high potentials for further expansion. So the precondition for power ticks and hydrogen is always a well set up renewable electricity. Uh, economy and of course financing costs and good country ratings are important and political frameworks and involvement of the local population but i see uh, this is going in a good direction also with the um, hydrogen atlas very important and this is also experience we have from other countries like chile where we work a lot on hydrogen we always need off takers so the investment case doesn't work if we don't have off takers who are willing and able to finance and um, yeah, this can be, of course, different people, different actors. Um, the first goal would always, is there maybe a cement industry, another industrial hub that would need hydrogen as a resource? Um, export, of course, is also an option. And um, we are also looking into niche and research project, which would be maybe the Zimbabwe case. So this is how we see it from our perspective. And I think we can do some more deep dives in the discussion that will follow now. Thank you. Indeed. Thanks a lot, Charlotte. And I, I think indeed uh, our audience uh, already has a very en encompassing view, I think, of the overall potential, a bit of the level of readiness huh, when it comes to the, the whole uh, green hydrogen discussion. Because wh wh when I first saw the, the theme of this session, for example, I was not expecting in the prep and in the exchanges with you all to, for example, already see projects happening. It, it's quite uh, impressive because when you see, uh, for example, I mean, there are not more uh, fossil-based or blue CCS projects that are already in operation rather than green projects. It remains quite new. Huh? And even in Europe, whereas there are a lot of pilot and demonstrations that are kicking in, we do not have projects which are established already. So we're talking about a very, very early phase. Um, maybe, I mean, as a start, because I think there is still a paradox which we need to, to address together here. And that's a question which I will ask to all of you, uh, starting maybe with Solomon. But we had this session this morning about access to electricity, and it was recalled by, by all of you. Half of the, uh, the population in Africa doesn't have access to electricity. How can this be combined? with the idea that we are already reinitiating uh, or initiating a green hydrogen economy, which relies per definition entirely on, elect on electricity. I mean, how, how can that be combined? Solomon, would you like to, to start? 
Yes, thank you very much uh, once again for, for the opportunity. So um, I, I, let me speak from the point of view of what we have so far done. Like I mentioned uh, during my spe speech, Africa has huge renewable energy potential. So whether you look at wind, whether you look at uh, PV, so you have huge potential. And our our is part of what we have seen so far is that yes, you have like 50% of the population without access. But if you have to meet this demand from renewable energy, you have the potential enough to meet to to make up this uh, uh, deficit from renewable energy and still have enough to generate substantial amount of uh, green hydrogen. Mm -hmm. Without you so, you, so sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so I, I do not think that um, in 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 this in that it's 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 it doesn't it, it it's not outright that you do not have a place for green hydrogen because you still do not have you still have a lot of place without access. So that's why I said in the beginning we take local preference into it. This is very important because there are the situations even though in generally speaking you have 50% uh, without access but the situation still varies from country to country so there are places where the situation is a lot a lot better and it's it, depending on the local preference you could take a part of the renewable energy actually to meet the local demand in terms of uh, providing access to electricity but then you we still have enough potentials to drive the the hydrogen initiative Thank you, Solomon. So what I get actually from, from what you say is it can work together, but the bottom line is that those renewables capacities are not built yet, basically. So they will need to be built uh, in order to deliver th those two priorities uh, at the same time. Yes, so the resources are there. We just need an infrastructure to harness them. Okay, so let's discuss then about how to, to harvest this. Maybe, uh, I mean, Charlotte, from, from the perspective then of the GIZ, because sustainability is very important, obviously. I guess also for you, it's important that uh, the green hydrogen boom doesn't cannibalize, uh, on the other hand, the access to electricity. So talking about additionality, well, how important is that for you and, and how to ensure that it is happening on the ground? Yeah, yeah, very important question. And I think for me, additionality is really one of the main yeah, factors and also the main criteria, sustainability criteria of, of all of them, because we don't want to be in competition with hydrogen, uh, yeah, with any other access to electricity or direct uses. Also talking about maybe more modern direct uses like electrification of the transport sector, because it's always more efficient to use it directly rather to, to transform it to hydrogen and lose 30%. And then maybe for export, we have to yeah, even reconvert it to hydrogen or something. So it, there's a lot of yeah losses that we would see if we yeah if we go only in the direction of hydrogen so when we talk to our yeah partner countries it's also something that we say yeah there are, there are two steps no we have the money and we have the brain and a bit we, we usually say okay the brain can go into hydrogen already and it should go into hydrogen because um it's a long process to have a change in um, yeah in an infrastructure, in, especially in energy infrastructure. It can take 20 years, so it's important to start with the research, to start with the feasibility studies, and to see where is uh, potential there, what could be potential offtakers, and so on. But for the finance, I would say in many cases, not in all of the cases, it's really important to do first the renewable electricity. So this prepares it's a precondition for hydrogen anyway so we we need electricity or renewable electricity for yeah for hydrogen but we also need it for everything else so there is no way that this is the wrong decision to invest into into renewable electricity for a country but mm -hmm. yeah maybe not too far going uh, with setting up infrastructure because as as you said we are only at the beginning of the learning curves also for cost reduction so it can the decrease will come as we saw with pv uh, in the last 20 years and it would make sense then to be ready to install um, yeah, the capacities when when the cost decrease has arrived. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So indeed, the, this long-term process to, to keep in mind uh, in terms of developing the technology, because it's true that there are kind of two challenges at the same time, developing the technology 
ensuring that we have the cost of advance for the technology and deploying the renewable that we will need to power those uh, electrolyzers because we're really talking here about electricity specific uh, if we talk um, uh, for renewable maybe from the perspective then of of the renewable deployment and looking into uh, the the countries um, fortunate do you think in Zimbabwe, in Zimbabwe we are deploying renewables at a pace uh, that would be satisfactory in order to produce renewable hydrogen and ensure access to electricity? How is it going, renewable deployment? Okay, thank you so much for that. Um, uh, well, what I can safely say is that um, because of the high capital, initial capital cost for renewable energy projects, uh, you would find that. Uh, it's not uh, being deployed at a faster rate as we would intend, uh, because um, we would find that uh, sometimes um, the issues um, we would have technical expertise uh, there will be there, but uh, when it comes to the proper execution, it needs uh, money. So you would find that uh, the the challenge of the capital uh, is actually. Uh, making it to, to delay to actually uh, ramp in these uh, renewable energy technologies. But nevertheless, you would find that uh, the opportunities uh, are there and the abundance uh, renewable energy sources are there. And uh, the only challenge will be the, the capital uh, costs, which are high at the beginning. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Fortunate. Do, do you agree, Chipo? So high capital costs that may impede uh, the deployment of renewables uh, in Zimbabwe and neighboring uh, regions. Do you think there are alternatives? I mean, how can we build all these renewables in the next uh, in the next decade? Thank you. I think uh, the major thing that we need to know about uh, green hydrogen and electricity is that these are complementary. The, at the moment, uh, energy from renewable sources uh, is being stored in batteries, uh, which are very expensive. Uh, maybe the, uh, the most expensive part for the renewable energy sources. Uh, if this green hydrogen is produced uh, and is stored in fuel cells, uh, then it can be used for anything uh, that is powered by electricity. So it can solve even the electricity shortage at peak hours so if we take into account that they have the high initial cost but the advantages are much more than the initial cost so we need to secure some resources such that we move a bit fast to deploy renewable energy resources and we don't want to separate them from green hydrogen because green hydrogen is a good storage for them and it's easier to transport it. In most countries, we have infrastructure in terms of pipelines for transportation of green hydrogen. And if used in fuel cells, as I said, it can complement electricity. So besides the high cost, we need our communities, our governments, to put much more effort in uh, securing resources for the deployment of these resources. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, indeed, Chipo, the, the complementarity, I mean, it, it's really interesting also, to, to, also to, to look at the end of the day at the infrastructure question, because it's true that your, your green hydrogen is going gonna, is gonna to depend on an electrolyzer. It has to be somehow connected to a grid. Uh, and, and hopefully to a producing installations. So, so that's one challenge. And then there is the other challenge because, okay, we, we, we have pipes uh, in Africa, in some African countries, but, but we don't have hydrogen ready pipes because we know also that, that those uh, infrastructures will have to be, to be adapted. So yes. how close are we to, to solve this challenge? Who would like to, to take this question? How are we in terms of infrastructure are we ready to talk about, let's say, Africa becoming a, a green hydrogen hub? What, what is the state of play there? Who would like to take this one? Can I take it? Go ahead. Please. At the moment, most countries are still on the negative side 
they haven't started much on the infrastructure side. Still, there is some ground search which is being done to find out what infrastructure is there, what form of adaptation is needed, what the financial resources are needed, and what human resources are needed for that adaptation. So in most countries, it's still at the research point where we need to find the recommendations from these researchers, then we move on and advise the policymakers such that we move on. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chipo. Maybe coming, bouncing a bit also the, the, the question to, to Charlotte. Regard, looking at the state of play for the infrastructure and for the, the question of additionality, which we discussed, do you think it's too soon to, fr from the perspective of a development agency where you have to prioritize a lot of projects, because I guess finance is not unlimited, you need to look at those actions that have the more direct impact. Is it too soon to, to kind of already start with renewable hydrogen or is it complementary? And, and if so, how do you make it work? Um, yeah, well, um, for the for the question, if it's too soon, I think I, I answered before a bit that I, I guess, uh, yeah, it is never too soon in terms of, of course, building up capacities. Uh, but um, yeah, in, in terms of maybe thinking also because you asked the question about the export uh, hub potential and is that something that that should be looked into? And I think here um, it's it's something where I would say no, um, it, it it would be nice. Or the first step should always be to look for uh, yeah local hubs maybe and to see is is there maybe a local off taker? It does local doesn't have to be like in the same uh, city or in, it, it can also be the same region. It can also it doesn't have to be the same country. It, yeah, it can be thought a bit broader. So so I guess uh, this should be the first step, of course. And and then in the in ter and also if we look into export, it's always yeah we already have um, the competition. Then no, it's as soon as we go on a global market, we compete to other global players. And as you said, we we also work with uh, other countries from other continents and also other um, countries like Australia, the MENA region, Chile, Morocco. They are all preparing themselves for becoming the expert. Uh, ex uh, port hub of green hydrogen. So um, this is something that, of course, every country has to think about. Can we compete? Are we competitive in terms of renewable electricity prices and therefore also hydrogen prices? Can we get cheap access to uh, investment also? Because this makes a, a project also more expensive. And can we then uh, yeah, play um, on this international market and compete internationally? So yeah, I think each country has to answer this for themselves themselves what makes more sense and what does make less sense regarding the export um, yeah, potential. What, what do you think, Solomon? Do, do you see uh, on, your, on your side some, some hot markets uh, for hydrogen that are arising where you can already tell to the people that are listening to us, go there, uh, it's boiling, it's ready. I mean, how do you see the level of readiness of the, the hydrogen market in Africa? Yeah, thank you very much. So I think I would I would first of all like to just uh, uh, stress something with regards to what uh, Charlotte just mentioned. So in terms of infrastructure, this will take a while to be built up. So it's something that perhaps will have to be faced. And, but of course, this decision would be at the different country levels to decide. But I, I personally think that it will take a while. So even if you would have to adapt existing infrastructure, this will take a while to, to happen. But one thing I would say is that right now, countries that are ready can already start to play a role in the global market. So if you look at the if if you if you look at if you look at hydrogen in terms of the local market, yes, you could find limitations, maybe infrastructures and all of that are not there. But beyond that, if you look at the global market, if you look at the global opportunities in terms of international cooperation, if you look at the global market in terms of, of, of uh, benefit, in terms of financial benefits for countries, so the opportunity is there. And uh, so I, I think that there is really no reason for any country that has the potential to generate green hydrogen to not already start doing that. And then come to think about it also, 
if you talk about climate change, that uh, it's it's a global issue. So any any kilogram of hydrogen that comes into the international market helps all of us in addressing the issue of climate change. So that's about mm -hmm. that. With regards to where you have the hot spots, like I mentioned before, sorry, I really would not be able to give like specific locations now. This we will make available online, I mean, in the next uh, couple of days from now. But I really would say that you have lots of uh, places within Africa where you have potentials. Like I said before, you sometimes it's difficult to find really one spot where you have everything. So where you have the 100% or you have the most mm -hmm. uh, of the renewable energy, but then also the most of the water resources that you would need for electrolysis, for example. So, so it makes it, uh, it somehow one has to find just the most suitable condition where you find uh, uh, conducive for for green hydrogen production. But one thing I would like to stress is that uh, it would be important, especially for for countries that are close to the coast, to consider very much the option of desalination. Um, mm -hmm. I said studies have shown that this it adds to the cost of, uh, of green hydrogen just probably 0.2%, sorry, 0.5%, just adds about 0.5% to the cost, or maybe just about 1%. So it's like if you have a, 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 a kilogram of hydrogen that costs two euros, for example, so you are talking about a cost that uh, increases by maybe one cent, or maximum two cents, mm -hmm. if you have to use the desalination instead of groundwater. So this mm -hmm. is what I will uh, I would say. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Solomon, and thank you for bringing in the the desalinization topic because that that is indeed something that was also very interesting in your presentation. Competition for resources that was valid for water, that was valid for land, and. Obviously, in Europe also, that's a very big topic because we have far less land available. So it's already, at least on the land side, a big issue in itself. And for water, it, it will it will come as well. But when it comes to the African uh, continent, obviously the resources as huge are huge. But we also know that for hydrogen, you need much more space, you need much more capacities. And that on the other hand, you also need to develop your electricity side. So at which point in time will there be a tipping point for this competition, which you, you say will happen? But at which point do you think the competition will become really an issue where we might have to choose between one way or, or another? <laughs> well, I, I think that, um, first of all, it's important to be aware that this can happen at some point. And the reasons are obvious. The population will be growing and then you would see also migration. You know, people move from one place to another. So a particular location may be free now, but maybe in the next 10 years, it's occupied because cities are growing. And then like I talked about also in my presentation, we you, you also should take into account the, the, the changes, environmental changes occasioned by, by global uh, climate change. So rivers could dry up, um, there could be several things that could affect resources. But having said that, so I think that number one, it's important to keep this in mind from the very beginning. That's why in the H2 Atlas project, we are looking at climate change scenario projected mm -hmm. into the next 100 years. How will the resources be affected? Secondly, we are also taking into account the, the urban migration and looking at also how this affects um, electricity access, uh, how this affects electricity demand. So where you have a demand of uh, let's say 2000 megawatts it's possible in the next 10 years this is doubled or this is tripled so will you still have the resources to to meet this so it's important to take all of these into account and begin already from now you know from in terms of the infrastructure that is built in terms of uh, of a uh, uh, capacity or the uh, local capacity that's also harnessed that this is taken into account this is very important because if this is not taken into account, like I said, a time really comes when uh, you, you really have a conflict. So mm -hmm. local uh, scenarios, local preferences should be very well considered where you have a reserve, where you have in terms of land, where you have uh, conservation areas, those should clearly be defined. This is one thing we have been 
yes. trying to really straighten out with our local partners in the project. Because if you mm -hmm. if you take a land area that is reserved, and then you place a, 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 a your infrastructure, whether it's a PV park or a wind park there, then it's possible that in the next five, 10 years, you have a problem with the local people. So this, this, this I think it's, it's very important and must mm -hmm. from the very first day, you know, mm -hmm. be part of, of the dialogue. All right, very important coordination and dialogue. Thank you, uh, Solomon, for this. I think one way also to avoid competition uh, is probably, and we have the same conversation again uh, from, from Brussels, uh, which is about the end use, because then you're not, if you have limited resources, if you have competition, you will need to choose very wisely where you will use each energy carrier, looking at the levels of efficiency. And Chipo, it's funny because your example on the car manufacturing raised some emotions uh, from the audience, uh, as I could see, because obviously in Europe, there is also this question of prioritizing electricity for road transport, um, where the regular passenger cars, we have this feeling that maybe it will be much better through electricity, saving hydrogen for harder to abate sectors. Uh, I would really like to, to hear your reply, Chipo, on that, on, on how you see the, the, the best use cases, actually, for, for renewable hydrogen. And maybe you can come back on the examples of, of cars to see how the debate is going on the mobility side. And then for Tunate, I, I, would, I would like to have your views on Zimbabwe as well. But Chipo, maybe to, to react on the car example. OK, thank you. For the car example, it does not mean that uh, the country is focusing its uh, hydrogen for use in the car um, in, in the cars, eh? but uh, each industry is looking at how it can benefit eh, from uh, the green hydrogen. So the transport sector is also seeing an opportunity in it eh, using eh, that eh, green hydrogen. But as a country, maybe it's alluded by Solomon, we need to look at the importance, maybe, to prioritize the use of green hydrogen. Mm -hmm. For example, in Zimbabwe, our country's economy is based on agriculture. So if we produce some few tons of green hydrogen, our first priority would obviously go to the manufacture of ammonia, which will be used in the fertilizer. Then if we have some excess, then we would look into other uses. So for this Africa, it doesn't mean they are focusing on it, but as an option, they don't want to be left behind. They want to find out what actually is the implication. Would it be sustained? So if they find it to be sustainable and already they have established the... So with this Toyota, which I said they are wanting to they have signed an agreement, they are not looking at the whole of the roads. They are just looking at just one road network, the M3 network, which join a road which joins Deben and Johannesburg. So that's where they want to do their testing, not on all types of vehicles, but just on the haulage trucks. So it's just a, a, search, a test which is being done, not that it's a priority. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Chipo. And maybe also for the car, because what, though we, we, when we look at uh, the Volvos, etc., actually, we yes. also think potentially that they could use green hydrogen with the steel. Uh, because hydrogen, though, uh, in, in the European debate, is associated with steel as well, uh, and, and how steel could be greened via, via hydrogen. So that can be also potentially a link. And looking at you, Fortunate, because I think there's one question we've not been mentioning here. When we talk about social economic benefits, we need to make sure the industry is there. So we were talking, Chipo mentioned also um, the resources uh, when it comes to materials. Um, so we have in Zimbabwe a, a clear case for agriculture, and maybe you can tell us a bit about that. But do we have also such things as electrolyzer manufacture? I mean, do, do you see also this kind of activities which will be key to make sure the, the transition is owned 
locally. Uh, do you see that happening in your country and in your region? Okay, uh, thank you so much uh, for that uh, important uh, question. Uh, what I would um, suggest is that, um, as, I, as, you, as you can um, see, uh, the, the, actually the industry, the industry um, needs uh, to be improved in terms of um, uh, the necessary, uh, like, um, like manufacture of necessary equipment uh, that is required, like for example, electrolyzers. Uh, we don't have any company that is actually manufacturing uh, the electrolyzer locally, and uh, I'm sure like um, simple chemicals have been also importing uh, the, the electrolyzers. So there is need to look at um, that uh, value chain so that uh, actually it can be improved. And uh, there is also need for creation of uh, of jobs. You would find that, uh, for example, uh, the issue of um, uh, electric vehicle in Zimbabwe right now, there is a what they call immobility strategy and framework that has been developed uh, with, uh, with the Ministry of uh, Energy and Power Development. So you would find that the green hydrogen can actually uh, come into play in that um, the, the manufacture of uh, fuel cells that can be also be used in the, in, in the electric vehicles. Uh, considering that there is already a, a strategy and a framework that has already been in place. So what I, I would just say is that um, these um, areas complement each other and there is actually a need to, to improve, especially in the setting up of the industry that supports uh, this technology. And also the other important factor which need also to be looked into is the issue of capacity building. You would find that uh, if uh, we actually uh, make uh, these technologies uh, come into play without the necessary uh, capacity building of the locals, it will be hard and it will be difficult to, to actually propagate this technology and there will be slow uptake of uh, these uh, green hydrogen uh, technologies. Uh, that's what I can contribute for now. Thank you, Fortunate. And uh, Charlotte, I would like to give you uh, the, the the closing uh, question, actually, because I think with we've seen also that uh, okay, the potential is enormous. Challenges here and there for for infrastructures and and build up, and and that needs to be sort of uh, very very carefully. But also, we need to make sure that those benefits are harvested locally. So we need to look at the end uses that are really making sense. We need to build the industry, do the capacity building. It is not necessarily yet the case. There, are, there is a comment from the audience asking also to which extent, for example, green hydrogen could help countries reduce their uh, dependence to fossil fuel imports. So the topic really of reaping socioeconomic benefits is, is um, high on the agenda uh, when we talk about green hydrogen in Africa and the green diplomacy. What, what is the, the perspective of the GIZ on that? What do you think is the role of development agencies, development banks, in order to make sure that uh, this actually conveys benefit to the African continent? Yeah, very, very good question. Of course, um, yeah, the role of developing banks or also public money in general is that, uh, yeah, we also attract uh, public uh, private money, pri private investment. But I think a big role, a very important role is also to bridge the gap between, uh, yeah, the co competitiveness and making like a business case, creating a business case if we are still a bit too far away of making it uh, competitive right now. And if we spend, of course, course, tax money and um, yeah, money from, from, from the governments, we have to see, okay, does the spending of money make sense? Does it really benefit the ones we want to support? Are we making an impact in the countries where we, we spend the money? And this is why I think both government, but also development uh, agencies and also um, yeah, banks um, should really look into sustainability criteria. So uh, we at GIZ and also in, in my work, but also the European, yeah, everybody currently is looking, okay, what sustainability criteria should be set up and um, in order to bring the benefit to the countries. And this uh, sustainability criteria shouldn't only be 
uh, environmental um, criteria, like we always say with the additionality, or also uh, where does the carbon come from? Where does the water come from? Are there conflicts with land? But they should also, of course, have the social and the economic uh, perspective. So seeing, okay, how do we benefit the population there? How do we train the people? Um, yeah, are research institutes involved? Do we use the capacities that are already and resources that, that we have in the countries? And uh, I'm very happy to say that in my uh, discussions also with developing uh, development banks, I see that they're working really hard on uh, yeah, creating those sustainability standards. So I talked to yeah, some, some um, development banks from EU level, German level, and so on, bilateral, international, and all of them are currently working on an investment scheme and uh, looking, okay, what kind of criteria do we need? And I think there is also a big advantage right now because they have the learning curve also in regards uh, to sustainability criteria from all other investments in the past, like the en renewable energy investment but also investments in infrastructure. So there's a good, good learning already. And yeah, I'm very positive that the banks uh, and also other uh, public givers uh, have this uh, considered. Thank you very much, uh, Charlotte. So that's quite a program huh, that we have ahead of us. Uh, I think we can uh, we can all agree a big, exciting program uh, to even further diversify the perspective for international cooperation, international development, and really create a whole new flourishing industry, uh, hopefully in Africa, making it one of the leading regions for renewable hydrogen. That would be very exciting. Um, there are a lot of, of uh, challenges or elements which we need to be uh, thinking about, but I think already uh, having those four pioneers on my panel, I'm very happy uh, to see that uh, you, you are actually involved in driving this from the ground. And I think it's already a very good start uh, to make sure that those are in your hands, at least partly. So thanks a lot to everyone. I really enjoyed the discussion. I hope uh, the audience did too. That was the end of uh, this uh, first day or this side event of the Solar Power Summit, which was focused on solar opportunities uh, in emerging markets. So a big thanks once again to all uh, our panelists for this afternoon, Charlotte, Fortunate, Solomon, Chimpo. Thank you very much. Looking forward to continue the conversation offline because we have a lot of work. Um, and to all of you, well, I can only wish you an amazing weekend. Uh, I hope it will be shiny uh, for you. And we will all meet back, meet back sorry, on Monday for the day one officially of the Solar Power Summit, which with a focus which will be more driven towards the European Union. However, that is not our last Get Invest session because we will have another specific session uh, which is co-organized with Get Invest about uh, opportunities in emerging market and the links with the Green Deal diplomacy. That will be the session Solar for Global Change and it will happen on the 13th. Until then, I hope you enjoy the day. A big thanks once again to everyone who made it possible. Our Director of Global Affairs, Mate Heiss, which has been uh, working like a beast behind the scenes, obviously, and the rest of the team. And I really hope you enjoy the day. Wishing you an amazing weekend. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you.